uh, the book of 1 Peter, a breath of victory, a breath of victory. I don't know why I titled it that. You'll find out, I guess, sooner or later. I was up in the mountains and I thought, that's fresh air. But then my, wife, my, my mind went back to wintertime when it all looks like Sleepy Hollow up there. And I thought, boy, it's going to be good to get back to Florida. <laughs> Amen. So praise the Lord, I'm home. All right, 1 Peter. 1 Peter. The Bible said, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. The Bible said that Peter was an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter number 1, verse number 1. And uh, we know that an apostle is a sent one. God handpicked him. Peter was the leader of the twelve. In John chapter number 1 and verse number 42, the Bible said, And he brought him to Jesus, that is, Peter's brother, Andrew, brought Peter to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. So here we have the Apostle Peter writing the book of Peter under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. Uh, he was an apostle. The Bible said that the Lord met Peter in John chapter number 1, verse number 42. And there is when Peter had not only his nature changed, but he had his name changed to a small stone. Remember in Matthew chapter number 16, when Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There, no way, no shape, form, or fashion was that talking about building a church upon the apostle Peter. Peter's a little stone. Christ Jesus is the rock or the stone that the builders rejected. So the church built upon Christ. Peter, of course, uh, is that little stone. And he proved to live up to his name. He sure did. Now, the Lord didn't give up on Peter. He worked on that shifting sand in Peter's life, made him a rock. Uh, uh, really, just a pillar of Christianity is what he was. No doubt Peter knew who he was dealing with because even in Matthew 16, which I've already quoted, in Matthew chapter 16, verse number 16, when Christ asked him, Who do men say I, the Son of Man, am? Some, said you, some say you're Jeremiah, some you're Elijah, another one, one of the prophets. But who do you say I am? And Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter knew exactly who he was dealing with. He believed Christ. He believed the deity of Christ. He believed that salvation was in Christ and nowhere else could any man ever find salvation but Christ Jesus and Jesus alone. Now, Jesus even showed Peter, if you think about this now, Jesus even showed Peter a kingdom that would be established on this earth. That's how much he thought of Peter, James and John. But Peter, over in the book of, uh, uh, what is it? It's uh, Matthew 17, I believe. Yeah, let me get over here to Matthew 17. Matthew 17, the first eight verses. You remember when the Lord Jesus took uh, Peter, James, and John up on the Mount of Transfiguration on the high mountain. The Bible said in verse 2, He was transfigured. Christ was transfigured before them, and His face did shine as the sun, his raiment, was white, his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Jesus, Lord, it, it, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. You know, I read all that to say this. That's how much Peter was thought of by the Lord Jesus. Thank God you and I are thought of just as much. But Peter paid attention to Christ, and Christ made sure that he showed Peter some things that Peter would need so that Peter could share with us. And he even went as far as showing him uh, a, a, a picture of the kingdom, a kingdom that would be established on this earth. And I was thinking as I'm in the book of Peter, you can go to 2 Peter chapter 3 and people are scoffing. People are scoffing at the Lord Jesus coming back, establishing a kingdom. In 2 Peter chapter 3, 
The Bible says in verse 4 in saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly are ignorant. Willingly are ignorant. You know, there's people that's ignorant, and that just means unlearned. But then there's people that are willfully so. One fellow over here in Pensacola said they're stupid on purpose. That's true. That's what it is. Isn't it? Stupid on purpose. They don't want to believe what Christ said. Do I really believe Christ is coming back? I've been hearing it all my life. Surely, preacher, you don't believe He's coming back. I guarantee you He's coming back. Why? Because He said so. That's why. He's coming back in the clouds. The Bible says in the clouds, not every eye is going to see Him when He comes back from the church, according to Philippians 2. But according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, He's coming in the clouds, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. And the Bible said we'll be with the Lord and forever be with the Lord. We'll have that great reunion with a glorified body. Seven years later, He will come back. Revelation 19, He will come back. Every eye will see Him. Every tongue will confess that He is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. They'll mourn. They will mourn in His coming back. The Bible says when He comes back in Revelation 19, He's coming back with a rod of iron. He's going to destroy the wicked nations. And He's going to set up His kingdom. And when He sets up His kingdom, that's exactly what He showed Peter, James, and John in Matthew chapter 17. The privilege of the apostle to see the kingdom. So they had no problem to, to even to entertain the idea that Peter, James, and John doubted the validity of the Lord Jesus Christ is, is, is ridiculous. It's, it's ridiculous. They saw Him. They saw Him in His glory, in His transfigured body. They saw Him. They heard the voice of God saying, Hear ye Him. This is my beloved Son. How in the world could you doubt something like that? You can't doubt it. They heard it. They believed it. So here is the Apostle Peter. And I'm all the way back in sec in uh, First Peter chapter number one. First Peter chapter number one. Peter uh, was a bold, rugged fisherman and uh, a Galilean. You remember when he would preach, uh, they made fun of him at Pentecost in Jerusalem, saying, "Aren't all these that speak Galileans?" In other words, they were saying, "Aren't all of these folks country bumpkins?" I mean, look, good Lord, they're out from the hill. They're from the holler. I mean, they have to pop in sunshine where they're from. You're going to listen to them? Yep, they're, they're Galileans, but God uses base things and despise things and things which are not. Why does he do that? To bring about the things that are. That's why he does things like that. So you will listen. My, 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 did Peter have something to say? A lot of people open their mouth don't have a thing to say, but Peter had a lot to say. Peter was a rugged fisherman, but his heart was tender. Notice in verse 18 and 19 of 1 Peter chapter 1. The Bible says in 18, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Look at chapter 2, if you will, in verse 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Now we're talking about Peter being a bold man, a blunt man, <clears throat> but he was tender. And so we don't let that rough exterior fool us, do we? He could counsel and comfort people who were going through difficult times. He's helped me, I don't know how many times. Read, look at verse 7 of chapter 1. He might be helping you today. He says this to you. He says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Wow, that's going to be something, isn't it? No, he had a heart. He had a compassionate heart. Now, the Bible does say he was an apostle in verse number one, a sent one, one with authority, commissioned by the Lord Jesus Christ. His message was to the strangers who were scattered throughout uh, several provinces in Asia Minor. And if you'll notice in verse 2, the Bible said, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Elect also means chosen ones. 
Paul talks all about the chosen ones in Ephesians chapter number one and verse number four. We're going to go there here just in a minute, but let me just stay right here in First Peter chapter one. Now, verse two tells us how this thing is going to happen, how this great, great operation of God, this plan of God is going to happen. Verse two talks about how salvation is going to happen. There's no confusion, no confusion with the word elect. No confusion here or anywhere else in Scripture concerning foreknowledge, election, predestination. Uh, if you'll notice the preposition in verse number two, the preposition uh, translated according to, according to, means that election and foreknowledge are harmonious and parallel to each other. The work of the Holy Spirit, sanctification, that's simply setting apart. And the result expected from what the Holy Spirit did is what? Is obedience. And this is all a part of the great operation we call salvation. And by the way, Peter goes on to say, it's on the basis of the blood shed by the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. Now, if you'll notice, back up to Colossians. Just hold your place in Peter and back up to Colossians. I'm going to explain it here just a little bit about foreknowledge and election and so on. Um, we are not, for those of you that are on the edge of your seat, we're not Calvinistic. We, 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 can re we refute the tulip theory, every, every point of it, every point of it, biblically refute it with verses and text and uh, we believe that it's a whosoever will gospel. We believe if you want to trust Christ, you can trust Him. We believe that God has given you a word to read and God's given you a mind and God Himself through His Holy Spirit will illuminate your mind to the point of believing. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You don't have to muster up faith. He does it for you through His word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing how? By the word of God. Well, I don't have enough faith. And you're telling on yourself because you're not reading your Bible like you should and asking God for direction. I'm in Colossians chapter number 2. two Colossians 2. And I don't know how long we'll park here, but uh, Colossians 2, verse 9, the Bible said, For in Him, in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. Now, God did this, not you. It's an operation of God. You're sick. God did the operation. Now, here's the beauty of it, though. You're sick. You're sick from your head to your toe. There's no soundness in you. Your heart's deceitful, and desperately wicked. The Bible said, who can know it? Your feet are swift to shed blood. There's poison of asp under your tongue. I mean, you're just in bad shape. You're in bad shape. Everybody in this church will write you off. That's how bad you are. But Christ didn't, did he? That's how bad you are. But let me tell you something, though. You're not too bad that you can't come in here and listen. And you're not too good that you can stay out. So this is where you need to be. This is right where you need to be. All right, now Christ is all and all. All right, you're bad. Now, the operation of God, you're the one that needs an operation. You need a new heart. You need a new mind. You don't have any bowels of compassion. You're in bad shape. But here's what God did. God became a man, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's deity. Never sinned, never did one sin. God became a man to satisfy His own law. He had a standard, and what was His standard? How do we read about His standard? The, the law, the, 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 yeah, the, the, old, the law that was glorious, 2 Corinthians said. It was glorious law. The law was God's standard. It was perfection. The law never did say try. The law always said do. And if you didn't do it, what happened to you? Death. The wages of sin is death. Well, Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, the seed of God, overshadowed Mary, Mary, and Jesus born of a virgin. Jesus, sinless Son of God, God the Son, the Son of God, 
lived a perfect, sinless life, fulfilling the demands of the law, of that perfect law, that holy God, the standard. So therefore, he is the only one that would ever be worthy to take your place and to die because God demanded what? Perfection. And you don't measure up. All right, now here's what God did. The operation of God, instead of God operating on you, God put His Son on Calvary and operated on Him. And after it was all said and done, when Jesus said it's finished, He looks at John Anderson over there and said, you're fixed. And John said, I don't believe it. Well, then die and go to hell. That's terrible for me. You say, boy, you don't have a compassionate heart. Yes, I do, or I wouldn't say what I just said. If you don't believe it, you're going to die and go to hell. Christ Jesus fixed what was wrong with you. Amen. And let me show you something else. Take, take your Bibles go to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. Then I'll go to Ephesians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Here's this chosen predestination election thing. Hopefully, when you leave here today, you'll be comfortable with these words. The Bible said in verse 13 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Using Scripture with Scripture is the best way to interpret Scripture. You, you agree with that? I can get books off the shelf, but you don't know what you're getting half the time. Some, some are pretty good. We follow along. But the Bible said here in verse 13, But we are bound to give thanks all the way to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. How did God choose you to be saved? Through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Aren't we talking about that in the book of Peter? Before the foundation of the world, God said, if you're going to be saved, you're going to believe the truth. The Bible says in Romans 1, 16 and 17, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Isn't that what he says? And it says, for therein, for therein, that is within the gospel, for therein is revealed the righteousness of God. How is it revealed? From faith to faith. Here a little, there a little. From faith to faith. And it goes on to say, the just shall live by faith. So if we preach the gospel, we better reveal the righteousness of God. Who's the righteousness of God? Jesus Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes it. All right, let's go to... Um, Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. God chose us to be saved by belief of the truth. Now, when you say elect, when you say elect, preacher, what are you talking about? Well, we do know, according to Scripture, that God, through Abraham, elected a nation to give us the oracles of God. He chose that nation. Elect, so... Don't let, don't let that word elect scare you. He chose that nation to give us the oracles of God. How do I know that? Romans chapter, say Romans 3, 1. I knew you knew that. Romans 3, 1. He chose that nation to give us the oracles of God. Thank God for our Jewish brethren who wrote down the scripture so that you and I could stand up here and read it today. Thank God for it. We, we had it. And only one Gentile I know that was involved in that was Dr. Luke. But, so we have the oracles of God, according to Romans 3, through the Jewish nation. So that, that, now there's another body that's elect. There's another body that's elect. It's the church. And that's the mystery that we're going to look at here in Ephesians chapter number... The whole book of Ephesians is talking about the mystery. The mystery is not that Gentiles can be saved. Gentiles were saved in the Old Testament. Ruth was saved. Rahab was saved. How did they get saved? The same way Abraham got saved. Will y'all let me do this and, and, and after the service don't talk about me running off on rabbit trails? Yeah, it really hurt my feelings if you did. <laughs> Genesis 15. Genesis 15. I'm going to get back to Ephesians 1. I think I am anyway. I'm looking at the clock. Genesis chapter 15. 
the, uh, again, we're talking about the elect. The mystery was not that Gentiles could be saved. The mystery is that Jew and Gentile could be in one body. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That was the mystery that was hid in the Old Testament, revealed in the New Testament. One body. So in that sense, the church was chosen or elect. Now, if you want to get real technical about it, you can go all the way back to Hebrews chapter 10 and you'll find that the world, mankind, was chosen to be saved by belief of the truth. Romans 8, 29 too, yes. All right, I'm in Genesis 15. So if anybody, anybody starts using language like elect, just hold your head up and smile. Yes, I am. Hallelujah. Yes, I am. God elected me to believe the truth. And he's a wonderful God that he showed me the truth and, 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 and illuminated that truth. Like Ephesians 2 said, he quickened you who you were dead in trespasses and sins. He illuminated that truth and I believed him. And I've never been the same. I'm born again. Are you sure you're born again? I am. Are you? I am. Are you? I've met him. I've met him in person. Oh, you know, not physically. But I met him and he's in me. All right, I'm in Genesis 15. Genesis 15. God brought Abraham forth abroad in verse 5 of Genesis 15. Don't miss this. If you miss this, you might just miss it all. This is one of those rabbit trails that'll help you. You know, we run rabbit trails, but as long as you catch the rabbit, an old preacher told me it was all right. Yeah. Genesis 15, verse 5. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. That's what God told Abraham. God used Abraham and forged the Hebrew nation. Also, Ishmael come out of his loins, but the promised seed being Isaac. All right. God told him in 15, 5, that he said, look at the stars and see if you can number them. So shall thy seed be. Seed be. And look at verse 6. And he what? He believed in the Lord and the Lord, he counted it to Abraham for what does a man need imputed to his account to go to heaven? The righteousness of God. God imputed to him the righteousness of himself. Now, if you'll read the rest of this chapter, uh, the, he, there was an offering made and uh, Abraham went to sleep. And he even told Abraham what to do before he went to sleep. He said, get you certain kinds of animals, split it in two, put one against the other. And uh, we get down to verse number 12. The Bible said, And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and they shall serve them and afflict them four hundred years. And they shall serve, and I will judge. Talk, even talking about going into Egypt there. Uh, and verse 17, It came to pass that when the sun went down, it was dark. Behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp, a burning lamp, a lamp of fire. That's the emblem of God's glory, the Shekinah glory. Burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land. All right, now, he had already, while Abraham was asleep, he made a covenant. Who did he make a covenant with? I mean, it, it, read, read it yourself. It, the, the animals were in place. Everything was in place for two to make a covenant. Hey, all right, now, yeah, Abram was asleep, so people cannot say that man had a part in this salvation plan. Abram was asleep at the time. The covenant wasn't made to Abraham until he was awake and he made it about the land. Look at Hebrews. Look at the book of Hebrews. Um, am I going too fast for you? I we got to catch this rabbit now. Y'all know. I, Hebrews, Hebrews 6, I believe. Uh, look at verse 13. Look at verse 13. Now, scripture, again, interpreting Scripture. For when God made promise to Abraham... Because he could swear by no greater, what did he do? 
swear by himself, uh, go to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. At least you're getting exercise in the Bible this morning. Galatians chapter 3. Verse 13. Well, let's read verse 8 first, and I'll go to 13. Galatians 3 verse 8. And the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, so that means a man's going to have to make a choice, right? This, I, I say, where are you getting all this Calvinistic stuff at? It's getting creeping in churches. God, anybody that's saved is going to be justified by faith. They're going to hear the gospel and they're going to make a choice. God will not violate your free will. God does not want a bunch of puppets on strings. Somebody asked me, they said, Preacher, did God create man knowing that man was going to sin? I said, yes, he did. Yes, he did. But I said, here's the gracious thing about God. God knew that man was going to sin, but he also knew that he was going to become a man and pay that man's sin debt. He knew that. And then he's going to give you the opportunity to choose him as your savior so that you, and this is what God wants, so that you of your own volition will love him back. He don't want a forced love back. He wants you of your own volition to love him back. Thank you, Lord, for what you did for me on Calvary. I trust you. You're my Savior. I love you. It's easy for me to love him back. All right, where am I at? Galatians 3, verse 13. Well, anyway, did I read verse 8? The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, okay, so Abraham heard the gospel. Verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of man, though it be but a man's covenant. Yet, if it be confirmed, no man can disannul it or add it thereto. Christ confirmed it with God. God confirmed it with Himself. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto the seeds as of one, as of many, but as of one unto thy seed, which is Christ. And so God made a promise with Christ. Abraham believed Christ. Abraham believed that God was going to use him and Messiah would come through his line, through his loins. And the Bible said in verse 17, And this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ. How was a covenant confirmed? Of God in Christ. God made a covenant with himself that he would save anybody that believes on his son. That's what he said. I don't know how you're going to distort that. That's pretty, pretty plain, isn't it? So there's no confusion anywhere in the scripture. Uh, back to back to Ephesians one. Ephesians one. We're talking about um, chosen. Let me get over there. Ephesians chapter one, verse number four. The Bible said, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So, so there you go. The Father selects, the Spirit sanctifies, and the Son sprinkles with his blood. Verse number four, the Father chose us. He chose the world to believe the gospel. Verse seven, the Bible says in verse seven of Ephesians chapter one, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. So the Son saves us. Verse 7 is an interesting verse. <clears throat> You'll also find it in Colossians 1.14. But we have redemption through His blood. Redemption is purchase. Per redemption means to buy back. We have redemption through His blood. When did Christ Jesus purchase the world? At Calvary. He purchased the world with His blood. 
He purchased the world. Redemption is not regeneration. So the world, if we look at this, the world has been purchased. You're, re, you're, you're regenerated or quickened the moment you believe it. The moment you believe what God says. Uh, and then if you'll notice in verse number 13 and 14, the Bible says of Ephesians 1, in whom ye also trusted after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. It didn't tell you to do one thing in Ephesians chapter 1, but to believe God. Believe God. The world, He reconciled the world. He purged the world. He purged our sins at the cross of Calvary. He bought the world. Now, your problem is you don't believe it yet. And you say, well, Brother Rowan, it's easy believism. I didn't say it was easy. Yeah, I grew up believing in Christ and so did you or you wouldn't be sitting here today. Probably you did. But do you really believe Him as the Scripture has said? You believe who he is. He's God. The woman at the well, Jesus told her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that spoke to you, you would have asked and I would have given you the water of life freely. Do you know him? Do you know what he did on Calvary sufficient to satisfy God's demands? If that's true, have you trusted him? Trust, believe, faith, synonymous. It's all synonymous. Don't try to confuse the words. It's all synonymous. The Bible said, when you heard the word of truth, verse 13, the, which is the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you, after you believe. So the question is, is what did you believe when you said you believed? After that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of His glory. We are predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. That's what predestination is. Child of God, you're a saved man. You know you're saved going to heaven. You don't have to lift your hand. You know you're saved ladies. You know you're saved young men, young ladies, men, women. Do you know you're saved? If you know you're saved, you know that it's predestined that you ought to look like him one day. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, he's coming back. I don't know what he looks like, but I know this. When he comes... We'll be like Him. That's predestination. That's Bible predestination. So we find here, back in our text, and Peter and I'm closing right here, uh, salvation, of course, Peter starts with that glorification first, that new body. And you can see why he does in 1 Peter chapter 1, because right after he talks about glorification and new bodies, he starts talking about trials. So let's, let's go ahead and get your eyes fixed on what it needs to be fixed on. I'm just a pilgrim. This world's not my home. I'm only passing through. Amen. My eyes should be over there. And so as I go through uh, this journey, man born of woman's few days and full of troubles, I go through this journey, it's assured that I've got a home on the other side. That's why Peter starts the way he starts. And so then he, he shows us that glorification. Then he starts talking about our present position and our inheritance in heaven. And uh, don't ever entertain the idea of losing what God has given you. Amen. And you know what salvation is by now. You've heard me talk about it. If you're brand new here, you still heard enough today about what Christ has done for you. You can trust Him as your Savior. But don't entertain the idea of losing salvation. Almighty God has permanently reserved it for the believer. It's a place reserved in heaven. It's called everlasting life. It's not called partial life. It's kept by the power of God. The issue was settled long ago between God and Christ. Amen. And uh, once eternal salvation is obtained, it's non-negotiable. Non-negotiable. No conditions on God not going through with it. That's the grace of God. If you save He's going to take you all the way. Amen. Uh, well, that's, I'm not done, but I am.